And now, the survival show which once survived 40 Texas summers. In this episode, we sit down with Stefan Gleason. He's going to share with us his deep knowledge of the precious metals market. It's a long overdue episode, and you're sure to learn all the basics of buying gold and silver for your prepper stash. Plus, we've got a special addition to the show to announce. Howdy, and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 181. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Today's guest is Stefan Gleason. Stefan is president of Money Metals Exchange, a national precious metals investment company and news service. He makes frequent appearances on national networks such as Fox, CNN, CNBC, uh, C-SPAN's Washington Journal, and that's just to name a few. The list goes on and on. Stefan, welcome to In the Rabbit Hole. Thank you, Aaron. It's very, uh, very nice to be able to speak to your listeners today. So let's dive right in. What role, and I, and before we get into that, actually, I'm going to complete, plead quite a bit of ignorance here. Precious metals uh, as an investment and also as a wealth preservation vehicle is something that I've wanted to learn a lot more about, but it's something that we haven't really done on the show because it is such a big topic. And so I'm glad to have you on today. Um, but I, I'm going to plead a lot of ignorance today and, and rightly so, because I really don't know that much about it. So this is going to be a lot of fun. And let's start off with the most basics, which is what role do, do precious metals play in a good preparedness plan and why should people consider owning it? Right. Well, well, that's kind of the fun, most fundamental question is, you know, what are, what is precious metals and why is it important? And this has really been driven out of the public consciousness to a great extent, particularly in the last hundred years uh, and, and especially in the last 30 or 40 years since we went off any kind of gold standard in the United States or, or in the world. And that is, you know, what, what is gold? What role does it play in our monetary system? And, and why is it something you should own? What, what, what is this all about? And I think most people are, are really newbies at this, and that's fine. Uh, probably less than 1% of the American people today own any kind of precious metals. So there's a lot of confusion and, and unfortunately, even some disinformation out there about what, what to do, what to buy, why you want it, how to sell it. So hopefully we'll go over a lot of those things in today's interview. But I guess taking a step back, first and foremost, precious metals, and, and specifically I'm, I'm primarily talking about gold and silver. Gold and silver are money. They are a form of payment. They're a, uh, a, a, a metal that has timeless value that's been recognized for literally thousands of years and chosen by the market as money. And it has certain qualities that have led to it being used as money and chosen as money over all those years. Uh, you know, ultimately, when things fall apart, people have gone back to gold or um, or silver, and it's because it, of its utility in trade and as a medium of exchange and as a store of value. It takes real work and real effort to get gold and silver out of the ground. Um, it's a prized, beautiful uh, metal that. Uh, that everybody, I think, inherently understands has value, but but it's not been used in the last uh, several decades, really, in any in any meaningful way as money across the entire world. Uh, so there's really been a war on gold and silver that's been going on, particularly since the 1930s, uh, with Keynesian economics and and socialism really coming to become sort of our economic model. And so anyway, the, at the end of the day, gold and silver is, is a very useful medium of exchange. It has uh, the, the ability to be divided into smaller parts and not diminish its value. So it's divisible. It's fungible. And, and that means that you know one ounce of gold is no different really than any other ounce of gold. If it's you know, four nines pure or whatever, it's, it's, it's gold is gold. And it's a uh, it's a form of payment 
that is the payment in and of itself. It, and, and what I mean by that is, is it, it's, sto- it's a store of value that has, you know, represents the effort and work that it took to get out of the ground and put into that pure form. It's not a, an asset that has counterparty risk. Now, most people don't look at, think about this, but every uh, dollar you have in your pocket is actually just uh, redeemable. It's, it's backed by debt. It's mm-hmm. not a, 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 an item of intrinsic value, except maybe the four or five cents that it costs to, to create it. And so, you know, that is a significant problem when it comes to maintaining the value of the dollar because they can be created pretty much out of thin air. And particularly when you talk about electronic currency being created, you know, with just did, you know, X's and O's or ones and zeros and, uh, electrons. And it's just not something that, you know, takes any real effort to create. And as a result, that, that privilege that, uh, our central bankers have obtained over the last hundred years has been terribly abused. And, and at the casualty of that has been the purchasing power of the fiat money or the paper money that is now in circulation and it's electronic equivalent. And so when it comes to gold and silver, a system that's where the money is gold and silver, or at least is redeemable in gold and silver, it creates a governor, a a restriction, a limitation on the creation of new currency units. You can't just create gold and silver out of nothing. It has to be mined. It takes a tremendous amount of resources and labor. So uh, getting off of the gold standard is really one of the greatest problems that we've created for ourselves that's led to an explosion in government debt and government spending and a devaluation of our money. And so, you know, in the last hundred years, since the federal reserve system was created, the dollar, the U S dollar has lost over 97% of its purchasing power. Uh, wow. you know, the same amount of goods and services now cost something like 33 times or 30, 30 times more dollars to to purchase, whereas the purchasing power of gold and silver has maintained, if not increased during that same period of time. And so that's the kind of thing that's created a flight to safety, a, a, a reliability of gold that has made it timeless. And, you know, there have been many other periods of time uh, where the currency was devalued. You've seen it happen in different countries where the currencies collapsed like in the last 10 years, Zimbabwe being a great example. Mm-hmm. There was a big... Um, big collapse in Argentina, uh, going way back, you have Roman times, all of these things have, uh, in common, the, the, the devaluation of their currency and gold and silver, uh, ultimately, you know, re- rebounded and became the coin of the realm after those things happened. Um, and in some, in the case of Zimbabwe, I guess they went to the dollar, but what we're seeing around the world now is as currencies and as this, that bubble has been inflated and continues to lead to problems. We're seeing a flight again to gold and silver. And so we're seeing that come back onto the radar for people as a way of preserving some of their wealth or having, if you will, insurance against the decline of their, of their dollar or the risk of holding other assets such as bonds or stocks. So gold is first and foremost money. It's also a form of insurance. It's financial insurance. So as, you know, just as you would have insurance on your house or on your car, uh, you should have some insurance on your, your wealth, your, your other assets. Uh, they generally will, gold and silver will generally perform well when these other assets do poorly. And so just like you don't hope to have to use your insurance or file a claim, you, you may not hope that, that you'll need your gold and silver, but if you do need it, you'll have it. Um, mm-hmm. assuming that you take steps to, to acquire it. So gold is a trusted form of payment, it's insurance, and it's ultimately it's money. So everybody should have some. And unfortunately, very few people do. Yeah. You know, it's to circle back to something you said that was really quite interesting uh, a little bit ago. Uh, you mentioned that there was a there had been a war on gold. Why, why is that? And we may be going down a very deep rabbit hole here, but I, just mm-hmm. purely curiosity, that really piqued my interest. So why? Well, gold is a restraint on government. Uh, Ah. Our politicians like to have the ability to write checks that, uh, that will get cashed. And, you know, when you, when you do that and your, your currency is backed by gold, there's a problem. And, and, you know, it it doesn't work because ultimately people will redeem your paper money for the gold. 
And that's actually what started to happen in the, in the 1960s. We were still on a, what was called the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was that the U.S. Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury would redeem U.S. dollars worldwide. You know, foreign governments could come, foreign banks could come to the uh, U.S. Treasury uh, or the Federal Reserve, and they could redeem their gold, or I'm sorry, they could redeem their dollars and get gold. And that was uh, a post-World War II thing that happened. The British pound had collapsed. They were looking for a new currency system. You know, Europe was in shambles, and they created a system that basically enshrined or or, uh, gave the dollar this privileged status of being the world's reserve currency. And the way way that we induced people to do that was to say, well, look, you know, if you want gold, you can turn it in and we'll give it to you. It'll be, you know, $42 an ounce per Per, per ounce of gold, just turn in your dollars and we'll give you the gold. Well, everybody started holding dollars around the world because, hey, it was as good as gold. Mm-hmm. Well, the the statists and the socialists that, that are have been running our country uh, using uh, Keynesian economics as their economic theory, which is a relatively new economic theory, about 100 years old, and that is that the government should step in and stimulate the economy. It should It should make up for the private sector when it when it uh, when the private sector is is declining, uh, basically it's central planning through monetary policy, and part of that is you know increasing debt and 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 creating new currency to to create new economic activity or at least the the idea the perception that there's new real economic activity happening, and so in in the 1960s uh, through the both the Vietnam War and also the Great Society. We were spending huge amounts. We were uh, going into deep debt, and a few countries said, "You know, they're kind of they're printing a lot of dollars there. Uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn in some of our gold, our, our dollars, to get our gold and bring it back." And uh, France, being probably the most prominent of of the ones that were doing this, was was showing up in New York with their dollars and, and taking ships of gold back. And the politicians didn't like that. Ultimately. Nixon closed the gold window and broke this treaty that said that we would, the Bretton Woods Agreement, that we would redeem our dollars for gold because all of our gold was flowing to France and, and other countries that were turning it in. So we defaulted on that, and that set the U.S. dollar adrift as a completely unbacked currency like all the others were up uh, pretty much at that point. So since then, there has been a total explosion in government deficit spending, debts, have been run up. You know, we're now at 19 trillion dollars. If you look at that point in time in the early 70s, I believe it was 1971, August of 1971, when Nixon closed the gold window, and you look at the uh, government debt, the U.S. government debt, it's like a hockey stick that starts at that moment. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, uh, the politicians don't like gold, and their friends in the media and everyone else who are invested in this big government deficit spending system that we have. They don't like it because it's the antidote to deficit spending. It's, it's not possible to go into huge debt uh, with a gold standard. And so, you know, since they like that, uh, since they like running up the debt and spending and, get, and, and, you know, making promises that they feel the voters want, they don't have to raise taxes. They can just print money. Mm. Uh, And, you know, everybody seems to be happy. But, you know, the casualty of that is the purchasing power of the dollar and tremendous financial instability that has resulted from that system. Hmm. So I guess to back up for just a bit, what exactly is or really was the gold standard? Well, originally there was gold and silver was just money in circulation. Uh, Our constitution set up a system that recognized that gold and silver were money. Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution said that, you know, actually restricted states from making payment in anything other than gold and silver. That's kind of fallen by the wayside, but it's still still on the books. Gold and silver were, you know, free market money. And the goal, the role of the government was really just to create standardization of the, of the weights and measures of it. You know, in other words, you would bring gold to the U.S. Treasury, and the U.S. Treasury would weigh it, assay it, and then stamp it with, you know, its weight and purity. And and a certain amount of of silver was considered the dollar, and that was just, you know, uh, I think it was 31 grains of silver was the Spanish mill dollar, which was the predominant, you know, 
uh, coin in circulation. And so the goal, the role of government was just to just to acknowledge and and give a sort of a stamp onto the the uh, the standardized unit. And so, I mean, we've gotten completely against that, uh, gone away from that. But then, then we moved into a gold standard um, in the in the 1800s. We kind of had a, a bimetallic standard where you had gold and silver as competing currencies. And then the Wall Street bankers were actually the the big the big central banks were in favor of going to a gold only standard, where it was just gold that would back the money and 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 sort of formalize the money. And there was a big debate in the late 1800s. William Jennings Bryan gave that big speech about you know the cross of gold, and you know he was he was in favor of a of silver in the monetary system. So it started with driving silver out of the monetary system to gold only, and mm-hmm. then once that ultimately happened, they just drove gold the gold completely out of the system as well. The idea of a gold standard is that you know literally that there's a fixed redeemable. Uh, ratio between dollars and gold, and that you could go in and turn in your dollars for gold. And so that was completely ended in 1971. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about, uh, or at least some discussion, particularly among some of the Republican presidential candidates during the debates, about returning to or or uh, going and reexamining how we can get back on a gold standard. Uh, so there is there is a movement kind of back in the in in the positive direction on this, but it's only been a result of more and more booms and busts, uh, complete abuse by the Federal Reserve System and blowing up these bubbles and then trying to stop them by creating and you know even more money and all this quantitative easing. So I think we're going to get back there. We're going to get back to a gold and silver type of monetary system. Hopefully it'll be a peaceful and and relatively smooth process, but yeah. unfortunately it could very well be forced upon us after a complete collapse. And, you know, I think that's the real danger is that, you know, we won't take any actions until we have to. And then at that point, it could be very disruptive. But putting that aside, there's nothing that stops individuals from going on their own gold and silver standard. And, you know, we, I personally and and our our company and, and our customers, most of our customers, view gold and silver not as a speculative investment, but as a another form of cash, another another form of liquidity that you diversify your cash into. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not talking about mining stocks and things like that. Those are truly speculative, you know, and, and there can be huge losses and huge gains. But gold and silver physical metal is another form of cash. And that's how I look at it. And that's how I think people should look at it. They can go back on their own gold and silver standard just by starting to accumulate the physical metal on an ongoing basis as a form of savings. Okay. You know, and you brought up a really big topic for most preppers, if not all preppers in general. We'll start it with here, which is would the economy ever really get bad enough uh, for us to potentially need precious metals for barter and trade? I mean, are what what is really the likelihood here that that we are going to see a collapse, and I guess have we seen any in the past where people have had to resort back to precious metals as as a form of uh, yeah. currency or money or exchange? Well, we've had several experiments with with uh, uh, paper money, and our founders were very much against it. Um, they had just come off of the massive inflation of the continental dollar and and all the you know problems that came from that. There was a period of time during the Civil War where there was massive devaluation of the money and people resorted to to you know to more use of of gold and silver in transactions um i think you know i think the likelihood going forward i think it's it's quite possible i would say it's not highly likely that we're going to be in a situation where we have to actually use gold and silver as the money uh, uh because of a dollar collapse but you know when when you're making a, an arrangement with somebody and you're trying to you're trying to get them to part with their goods or services, I mean, and you need those goods and services, and they want gold. I think you know, and more and more people, I think, will start saying, you know, I'd I'll I'd like to be paid in gold, or or you can get it, you can get this for a little less if you pay me in gold. We're already seeing some of that. Uh, we're already seeing people use gold as a currency, in you know, sort of a, a barter type situation. Um, it's not true barter because you know the Actual barter is, you know, you've got a, you know, eggs and you want to get wheat, and you got to find somebody who 
you know, has wheat, who wants eggs, and and that that's one of the reasons that gold and silver is such an efficient tool in the in the process of trade is because it stores that value, and and it allows you it allows the economy to more efficiently, you know, function where people can you know you don't have to find the person with wheat, uh, you sell the you sell your eggs for 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 the gold or or even the paper money, and then you turn and and turn around and use that to buy the the goods when you find the person who has it. Maybe they didn't have the you know, they didn't want the eggs. You sold that to someone else. So mm. I guess I, the point is that we really don't know. But putting that aside, I mean, one thing we do know, and it certainly is, you know, been shown to be the case by the last hundred years of history, and that is that gold and silver are going to rise in relation to the U.S. dollar. So I don't see any downside in diversifying your money into gold and silver. Uh, you, when you do that, you should. Uh, certainly take into account the possibility that you'll have to transact with it. And there's certain forms of it that probably are better for that than others. And we can get into that. Uh, but even if, if we don't end up in a total collapse where the, nobody will accept the dollar, uh, mm. you're probably going to do pretty well. Uh, you'll be able to turn in your gold and silver for more dollars down the road. You know, I, I personally am not interested in spending my gold and silver. Right. I, as long as I can turn in my paper money for to get somebody to give me something of value, then I'm willing to do that. I'm not willing to actually save in paper money, or you know, I I I certainly don't want to hold a bunch of cash, except as a you know as a an emergency measure. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to put all my money into cash. I, that would just be completely uh, destroyed by inflation. But you know, ultimately, if if it does get into that situation, I'll have some gold and silver that I can spend, and and you know, we may we may see that. I I hope it doesn't happen. I think it's probably less than a 50% chance we'll ever see that kind of thing on a widespread basis, but it's quite possible mm-hmm. and you need to be prepared for that. You brought up barter with, with gold and silver and doing that, that people can do that now, obviously what, but I guess what are the legal issues around um, if you were going to report it, we'll say, what are the legal issues around uh, transacting in precious metal? Well, uh, the IRS is uh, is getting a little bit more um, cognizant of this kind of thing happening. Um, they've gone after, you know, they've been going after garage sales. They've been looking at Bitcoin, and you know, their position is that you know, if if you have a gain in gold and silver, uh, that you would have to report that as a capital gain. Um, so there are some practical hurdles, unfortunately, in because of the the taxation that gold and silver uh, currently face along with many assets, you know, it, it's, you already get, you know, you, you lose purchasing power, which is, you know, one thing that's called the inflation tax. Mm. You lose just, just owning paper money. You lose purchasing power uh, from to inflation, but say you, you buy or own gold and silver as a hedge against that. Well, you know, they're probably going to go up in, in their dollar price. Unfortunately, however, just like any asset, if it goes up in its dollar price, the U S treasury feels you've had a gain, a capital gain, and they tax that. They tax it at a discriminatorily high rate when it comes to gold and silver bullion, a 28% rate for a long-term capital gains rate. So that is a, a, a practical impediment. You know, If you want to comply with the law and you get something of value uh, in that, that you, you, know, you got a gain on your gold and silver, you may have a taxable event that you'll need to report, um, just like if you use Bitcoin or, or even in actual barter. Um, there, I know there's barter exchanges out there where people can trade their services for other services. Um, the IRS takes a position that you need to uh, report all of that kind of activity and potentially pay taxes uh, on the income that you receive. Even though you didn't receive cash, you may have received something in kind. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's something that you really have to look at your, talk to your accountant about. Uh, it is an unfortunate uh, reality that the IRS does take a position. They don't view it as money. They view it as property. And so that that is something that you know we're looking at in terms of the longer term. I have a project through my company called the Sound Money Defense League, and we're looking at public policies affecting gold and silver ownership, including, unfortunately, many states. If you buy at a local dealer, you have to pay sales tax. So it's kind of a crazy thing if you imagine, you know, if you if you were to change a dollar for four quarters, that's not a taxable event. There's no sales tax on that. But if you change if you change uh, twenty dollars into an ounce of silver, in some states they view that as a as something that sales tax would apply to. Amazing. Um, the way around that is to 
is to buy from an out-of-state dealer where the interstate commerce clause prevents you know the collection of those taxes uh, at least by the dealer but you know there are many things you know, on the books right now that are treating gold and silver as not money but as property and that can be taxed hmm. what a what a mess you know and i guess let's get into the big question on a lot of people's minds of where do they even get started with with getting into precious metals well, the first thing, and this is a big focus of my company, Money, Money Metals Exchange, is to get educated on what, you know, why you're owning it and how to own it. Mm. And unfortunately, um, a lot of folks are being sort of diverted into the wrong kind of thing. And we can get into that in a second. But yeah. the, the bottom line is you want to own gold and silver that you purchase as close to the actual melt value as is possible or as practical. And that means that, you know, you want to take a look at what the price of gold and silver is. You can go to any number of places and see globally live 24 hours a day, what the price of gold is per ounce, what the price of silver is per ounce. And you shouldn't be paying more than a few percent over that. Uh, silver sometimes has a higher premium, sometimes 10, 15% hmm. over the, the spot price for you to get the physical form in your hand, because there's minting costs and, and, you know, there's obviously a chain of, of dealers and, and wholesalers and mints that, you know, have a very small margin that need to be able to, you know, keep that, that flow going. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, they need to make a little money, but the bottom line is you want to, you want to uh, look for things that are close to the actual melt value of the metal. And as long as you stay true to that, you pretty much can't go wrong because and, unless it's in some form like it's not pure or nearly pure, or it's not recognizable at all, or it's just a big hunk of, of rock. Uh, if, if it's in uh, relatively pure, if not pure form, and it's a, a well-known or reasonably well-known form of the metal, then uh, you should be fine. And basically, that's the most important consideration. But the way you start is you know, get educated. Go to, uh, go to a, either a local coin shop and, and look at what they have, or go to moneymetals.com and look at the products that we have, or there's other, there's other high quality online dealers out there. Give them a call, give us a call, uh, ask questions, get on their email lists, hear about, you know, what they're, what they're saying about, uh, the markets, about, uh, about what offers they have. And, uh, then start small, start with a small transaction, test the person out, test the dealer out, make sure that they make good on their commitments, make sure they deliver quickly Make sure they have good communication with you as the customer, that they absolutely meet uh, with what they promised. They, they give you what they promised in a timely fashion. And if you are successful, then, uh, and you should be, although there, there are some horror stories and we can get into that, how to avoid those in a minute. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the first thing. Start small, get comfortable with owning it, get comfortable with who you're dealing with, it, dealing with and then uh, go from there. I found that and this was the same case with me 15 years ago when I first started owning gold and silver. You know, you you hold a silver coin in your hand and you kind of think about it. It's heavier. It's got this beautiful ring to it. If it if you bang it on something, it's in fact that's that that's the whole origin of sound money. By the way, sound oh, money is money that you could determine was gold or silver by its its melodic ring. Hmm. They actually tested it. And that was a way you could tell it was pure, or that you could tell it was gold or silver. It has a very distinct ring, but it's it's heavier, it's beautiful, and you know I I found that just putting a gold or silver coin into somebody's hand for the first time really gets some wheels turning. It, it makes you start to think, you know, what why does this piece of paper have the the value that it says it has, and what what is this? What what is this paper money? How is it created? Why are people accepting it? And, you know, for me, it was a, a pretty quick process, but it really, it started with getting a little bit of gold and silver in my hand and starting to research it and think about it. And so I think, you know, as you, as you go do that yourself, you'll find uh, you'll have a greater understanding and appreciation of what you're holding and what you're holding is real money that has maintained its value over thousands of years. And I think you'll probably want to get more. And now for a quick break, listeners, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH, we'd love to give you more. Visit ITRH.net to find out about membership benefits. For starters, 
members get access to every episode ever produced and a monthly virtual conference. That's just for starters. And it's important to know, In the Rabbit Hole is supported nearly entirely by roving horde armada members just like you. That's how we pay the bills, stay on the air, keep the lights on around here. So go to iturh.net to learn how you can become part of the iturh roving horde armada. Next up, subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast app to make sure you never miss an episode by going to intherabbithole.com slash iTunes or intherabbithole.com slash Stitcher or intherabbithole.com slash iHeartRadio or intherabbithole.com slash Google Play or if you are one of those weirdos who listen to the show through YouTube, you can go to intherabbithole.com slash YouTube because you know what? We support weirdos. However weird you want to be, we're all about that. Now, back to the show. So when it comes to gold versus silver, and this actually becomes a very odd but large uh, prepper debate, which which one makes more sense? And I guess what why why one over the other to make it simple? Well, uh, silver is I think probably the preferred, and I think for good reason, uh, metal of the prepper type people, and uh, you know you can get a lot more metal for your money. Mm. Uh, it's currently about 60, you know, 68 ounces of silver purchased one ounce of gold. That's historically showing that silver is undervalued versus gold. You can get a lot more silver for your money and, you know, silver, uh, well, let's just take a step back. First of all, in the earth right now, it's a roughly a 10 to one ratio of ounces of silver to ounces of gold. So there's about 10 times more silver in the earth underground than, than gold. The monetary ratio that typically held for thousands of years was in the 15 to one range. So silver, it took about 15 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. Well, now, you know, we've seen the gold silver ratio, the relationship in the gold price versus the silver price rise to really, really high levels. Um, it actually got up to about a hundred to one in the last, uh, well, I guess it was in the late nineties. Mm. So then the bull market started, and in a bull market, silver will almost always outperform gold hmm. in terms of percentage gains. And, you know, it's a smaller market. It's, it's a little less liquid. Silver has been demonetized substantially over the last uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, we talked about, you know, partic- starting in the 1800s, really, but um, ultimately the final straw was in the 60s when the dimes, quarters, and half dollars became clad coins that no longer had any silver starting in 1965, except for the half dollar, which, you know, continued to have some silver until 1968, I believe. Uh, Canada, I think, uh, demonetized and and removed silver from its currency in the late 60s as well. So uh, silver has been used to be hoarded by governments because it was part of its, the way they minted coins. Mm. And it was also a strategic asset uh, that was had military applications and so forth. But ultimately, what has happened with silver over the last 50 years is that it's been not only de- demonetized, but it's been consumed. So as of today, above ground, there's literally about 5 billion ounces of gold, but barely more than a billion ounces of silver above ground in recoverable form. Hmm. And so silver is today actually more rare than gold, if you look at what's outside of uh, outside the Earth itself, that's why. So that's pretty interesting. And then at the same time, you have silver coming back into the financial system, coming back as an investment asset at a very high rate compared to gold. Uh, I've heard it uh, reported that as much new investment dollars are going into physical silver as is going into physical gold, and yet the silver market is you know is. 70 times smaller or whatever it is. It's much smaller. And so that's a tremendous amount on the margins of new demand coming in. And at the same time with silver, it also has had an explosion in industrial uses. Now, it used to be used in photography, which has phased out almost completely with the advent of digital photography. Mm. But at the same time, it's been more than made up for by high-tech demand, uh, medical demand, and... You know, even things like solar uses silver. 
It's the best natural biocide, so it's used in a lot of uh, medical um, instruments and sprays and so forth that kills some, some 400 microorganisms and viruses. So it's the best natural biocide. It's the best conductor of electricity of all the metals. It's the, it's the best reflector of light, and it also conducts heat. So it, it has some amazing qualities that have caused industry, particularly as we head into sort of this nanotechnology and high technology uh, smartphones and LCD TVs and solar panels. So silver is a vital component to all of these things, and that has created a lot of industrial demand. So you have basically this perfect storm of monetary demand coming back into play, industrial demand increasing, and at the same time, the supply has has now gone flat and even negative. So the new production is actually 2015, we think, is probably – the peak silver production that we'll see 2016 should be lower. So you have all these things coming into, into play. You have higher demand, less supply, and we're starting from a point where silver is way undervalued historically versus gold. So you add that to the fact that it's, it's a small, it's something you can buy a lot more of for little money. It's smaller increments. If you're using it in transactions, obviously, if you have a gold coin, it's kind of hard to use a gold coin for, for, to buy something, unless it's something large, you can't buy a loaf of bread with it very easily. You might mm. be able to buy the bakery, but you can't <laughs> necessarily buy a loaf of bread. So that's where silver comes in. It's 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 much more um, attainable, I should say, by the average person. You can buy it in small amounts and just accumulate it. And so, as far as silver goes, I think you should probably favor silver at least fifty percent, pro- probably of. Uh, 60-70% of your precious metals should be in silver and not gold. Gold's great, but um, silver is probably better. And certainly as this bull market continues, we should see silver outperform gold by by many multiples, uh, perhaps three, four, or five times higher uh, returns on silver. But also keep in mind that silver is more volatile and so if you have a very short-term time horizon, and, and I don't recommend that you buy gold and silver if you have a short time horizon because it's, you know, that's speculating. Mm. Uh, but if you do, then you probably should buy gold because gold tends to be a little more stable. It doesn't go up as much. It doesn't go down as much. Uh, if you buy silver, it's a little bit more of a roller coaster ride, but two, three, four years out, I think you'll be very happy that you own silver. And, you know, this year is a great example. Um, silver has outperformed gold substantially. Uh, they both done extremely well since January, but, you know, at this point, we're looking at silver gains uh, close to 40%, and we're looking at gold in still in the 20% to, to uh, less than 30% gain. I mean, those are obviously phenomenal gains, and it comes off of very bad years of, of decline yeah. from the highs in 2011. But it just shows again that as the bull market ro- roars ahead, silver will outperform gold. So I think, you know, for a lot of reasons, silver is probably what you want to favor. Okay. And when it comes to rounds versus bars, and I, I guess that becomes kind of a, a mixed bag because there's the people who are buying to collect co- who are coin collectors, but then people who are really just focused on buying precious metals as a store of wealth or a hedge against inflation. What makes more sense for them to get into? Is it coins? Is it, I mean, rounds? Is it bars? Where, where does that land? Okay. Well, let's, talk about coins first. And this actually gets into one of the danger areas of uh, precious metals ownership. Most of the folks that are advertising on TV and saying you should buy gold, you should buy silver. And, you know, we agree with that message, obviously. Hmm. Um, However, unfortunately, most of them, and particularly those with the celebrity spokespeople, are actually doing a bait and switch. And they are trying to get you, once you call them up, they try to get you not to buy silver bars or even U.S. silver eagles that you can still get for less than $3 over spot, over the spot price of silver. Uh, but they try to get you into rare or collectible coins or proof coins where, you know, they're very spiffy, they're very shiny, and they come in graded. They're, they're graded with a certain quality score, you know, by by various associations that, that look at these. They put them in plastic cases, and, and they're supposedly worth a lot more than their actual melt value. Mm. And unfortunately, a huge number of people have been ripped off 
even as gold and silver has gone up dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years, people have lost big money in buying these so-called rare and collectible coins. And so unfortunately, as the small group of people who are now, you know, I mentioned probably 1% own gold and silver, that'll increase. And as that continues to increase, you know, you're still among an elite few people who figured out, hey, I need to own some gold and silver. I need to diversify my cash and, and own some real money. And unfortunately, at the very last moment, there's these rare coin dealers that are tricking people into putting their money into stuff that costs often many multiples of the actual melt value of the coin. So you might buy, you know, a gold, uh, a St. Gaudens gold coin, and, and it may be worth because it's just under an ounce of gold. It may be worth maybe thirteen hundred dollars an ounce, uh, but in their melt in its melt value anyway, but they tell you, Hey, this is collectible. This is a high grade. This is an MS mint state 65, you know, yada, 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 uh, worth a lot more. You, you know, you're going to pay, you're going to pay $4,000 for this and it's going to go to 10,000. Well, I mean, unfortunately what happens over time in a bull market is premium will always fall, um, as a percentage of the, the metal content, the premium, meaning the amount above the spot price falls. So, on top of that, you have these massive bid-ask spreads that are charged on uh, these these rare and collectible coins, where if you turn around and try to sell it back, even the same day, you might get 30% less. And that's a huge amount that's in play. It's how they pay for the celebrity spokespeople. It's how mm-hmm. they pay for the TV ads. It's how they pay for the, uh, the commission salespeople that are, that are calling you every day from these outfits. So the first thing is, Stay away from rare and collectible coins unless you are a true expert and have the time to actually get to know that market. Um, There is some value there if you really know what you're doing, but most people have no business buying that stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of people are getting ripped off. So, okay, suppose you've made that most fundamental decision and made the right choice and stay away from the rare and collectible and proof coins. Okay, so then, then the next question is probably less, much less important. Uh, but it's you know it's still worth considering, and that is what form of bullion, coin, bar, or round should you buy? Mm. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we think that you should try to get the lowest, you should get the most gold and silver for your money. So that means try to buy things that have the lowest premium. The things that have the lowest premium generally are the bars, okay, or the rounds. So. That said, uh, when you sell back, you might get a little higher premium for the Silver Eagle than you'll get for the Silver Round. But you have a little bit of your money tied up in the premium and not the metal. So if silver doubles or triples or quadruples, as we expect, you're not necessarily going to see that part of your investment that you put into premium also increase. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure you'll still do just fine, but... The bottom line is, you know, a lot of people like the coins because they're government minted. They have, they're maybe a little more recognizable than any, any old silver round or bar is, but in practical terms in the market, they're all very liquid. They're all accepted. They're all easily sold, but it's a a matter of personal preference. If you're willing to pay an extra 5% for a silver Eagle that has a, a U.S. mint stamp on it that, uh, you know, maybe gives it a little bit more cachet then you know that I wouldn't fault you for that at all. We sell huge amounts of silver eagles. It's the most popular silver coin in the in the world. Um, there are other government minted coins like uh, the Canadian maple leaf or the Austrian Philharmonic and other and same with gold. There's the gold Krugerrand. These are all government minted coins that can be bought at relatively low premiums. But if you really want to get the most metal for your money, then look at the bars in gold and look at the uh, bars and rounds in silver. So when you say rounds, because I always just assumed, partially because I'm a simpleton, but I always assumed rounds and coins were the same thing. But it sounds like those are not actually the same thing. Right. They're, well, they look the same and they have the same weight and purity. Okay. Uh, like like a one ounce silver round and a one, one ounce American Eagle hmm. are both the same amount of silver. One of them is government minted. One of them is privately minted and you pay a little extra for that government minting. So, you know, and there's a government guarantee to that and it also has legal tender value. So theoretically, if you're, if you're not very prudent, you can spend your one ounce U S silver Eagle for $1 because it has that U S government legal tender value. Mm. Uh, Of course you would never do that because it's worth over 20. uh, But you can, 
and it has again the government uh, government guarantee to the extent that is worth anything. Um, so, and again, there's some cachet because it's a recognizable coin. But a silver round is a privately minted coin shaped. Uh, ingot or or piece of silver. It just it, it will usually have its weight. Well, all, almost always has its weight and purity stamped on it. it. Usually has a mint mark. Sometimes a very attractive design. Some of them are not very attractive at all. But it really doesn't matter because it's valued for its silver, not for its design. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a personal preference. You would probably pay an a dollar or two more per ounce on silver to get a silver coin versus a silver round. So, and silver bars, actually silver bars are not really much different in price than silver rounds, but, uh, that's another way, unless you buy larger bars. Mm. So like, like the, the 10 ounce silver bar or the hundred ounce silver bar, or five ounce silver bar, those are very economical ways to accumulate silver. You can get those for well under a dollar over spot. We frequently have sold those particularly on promotions down into the 80 cent range over spot, sometimes even lower. So mm. that's, that's a great way to get a lot of silver for your money mm. by the 10 ounce bars or the hundred ounce bars. And then you have this super but, you know, cool that, paperweight. That, that's not necessarily in the form that you're going to, somebody's going to want, you know, at, at a local coin shop, they might have a little more difficulty selling a hundred ounce bar. You probably have to take more of a discount. You wouldn't with yeah. us, you'd, you know, we, we get very high, buy prices, you'd probably get over spot for it uh, when you sold it back. But, you know, some people like the smaller uh, denomination stuff, and particularly in a barter situation. So, you know, we have half ounce rounds, we have 10th ounce rounds, very popular. Half ounce and 10th ounce rounds tend to have a little bit of a higher premium than the one ounce rounds do. Uh, But they also have the advantages Mm -hmm. that come with it of being smaller and more divisible. So this brings up and I coming off the bars and buying in quantity versus not what I guess in a nutshell for somebody getting started, what makes sense? Like, do you buy a coin a month or a few coins a month, or do you save up and make an annual purchase to maybe get some sort of bulk discount? Like where, what makes the most sense there? Well, it is true that you can often get a little bit lower pricing when you make larger purchases, but the the problem, you know, and I think the the best thing for people to do is is to start with maybe a single purchase, get comfortable with what you're buying, and then go get on a monthly savings plan. We have one at moneymetals.com, where the beauty of that is you can put it on on autopilot. Essentially, you don't you don't have to think about it; it just happens. You set it up. Uh, we debit your bank account, or you or if you want to have, you know, send in a manual check, you can do it that way. But the idea is you want to set yourself up on something where you can just forget about it. And one of one of the insidious things about the income tax is the is since we've had payroll deduction, mm. you know, nobody really uh, thinks about how much they're paying in, in federal and state income taxes. And at the end of the year, it's, you know, it's kind of a psychological manipulation because at the end of the year, people are like, Oh, I got a refund. Hey, this is great. Well, they, you know, really what happened is you, you, you were overpaying your taxes in advance to the U S government or to the state government. And you just got a little bit back. So you should be angry, not happy. But the point is that it changes the psychology when you have things happen automatically, when you don't have to take the action. So use that to your advantage when it comes to accumulating gold and silver Put it on some sort of automatic savings plan like we have, or and, and there are we're not the only one out there, where it just happens automatically, and then then you don't have to worry about it because a lot of people will try to time the market, and you know I think now is a good time if you are timing the market to be buying because we're at still relatively near four year four year lows, five year lows actually. Mm. Although you know obviously this year things have been going up pretty fast, but the point is that we're still pretty low, and so if you're going to time the market now is probably a decent time, but. Most people aren't very good at that, and you know it's not really you don't want to go all in at once. So I would suggest start small, get on a regular plan, and then when you have extra liquidity and you want to add to your position more strategically, or you just have more you know more to spend or invest at that time, then go ahead and make the one-off purchases. So I think I think dollar cost averaging is a good good approach and putting it on autopilot, particularly for people that are not familiar and, and experienced with this. It's, it's, there's a lot of anxiety when, you know, is now a good time. Well, you know, if you're not going all in at once, then you don't have to worry about it. In fact, you might, you might even uh, want prices to go down more mm. 
because then you can buy more. So, but if you go in all at once, then, then you're kind of trying to, to pick it and it can be a little bit uh, stressful for people. So okay. I think a, a good plan is a monthly plan, but whatever you want to do, I mean, the bottom line is most people don't own gold and silver. And I think it's just downright dangerous for you not to have any. So that first purchase, get it done. Don't worry about timing it. Just get started. And then once you have accumulated some over time, then you can start maybe getting more strategic about when you buy. But if you don't own any, then I think you're making a big mistake and and that needs to be fixed right away. So going back to what you were saying earlier about things to avoid, specifically we were talking about the collectible coins that, that people get suckered into. What are some other things people need to avoid scams to be aware of where to, where, where does that go? Sure. Well, uh, an, one of the most important things, uh, actually I should say the most important thing is not getting the best price. It's getting delivery. And so there's also unfortunately been some blow ups in our industry where dealers who have, you know, shown lots of indications they were having problems for people that were paying attention went belly up and people gave them their money and had not received delivery and in many cases lost their money. There was a, a blow up with Tolving and company, which was a low cost dealer, but they ended up blowing up and they, they didn't deliver to $20 million worth of customers. Um, there's, wow. you know, federal investigation, there's lawsuits, bankruptcy, but the bottom line is most, most of that money was lost. So you want to pay close attention to Number one, the BBB listing for that dealer. Do they have a lot of complaints? How do they deal with those complaints? What kind of complaints are they? It, you know, delivery delays is generally not a, a good sign. There are situations that happen in the market where delivery delays are, are necessary, particularly if it's, you know, on a certain product and there's a bottleneck. But that should all be disclosed up and up front. You know, we don't sell anything that we are not, uh, you know, that we don't have our hands on and that we won't be delivering to you unless we tell you that there's a delay on this particular product and then then you uh you can make the choice or you can buy something that's immediately available. Mm. There was a period last year, 2015, for two or three months where there was a huge backlog of production because there was a massive buying frenzy that occurred around the Greek Brexit vote or the Grexit vote, I guess it was. Mm. And and the Chinese stock market was collapsing there, and there was just a big frenzy of purchasing, and and there was there was a, a bit of an issue with production, and so on certain products we had to quote delivery delays, but that was a very unusual situation. I think that could happen again, but the bottom line is you want to you want fast delivery, and if somebody doesn't meet their commitments to you, then that's a big big warning sign. So uh, that's one thing to avoid. We talked about the rare coins and the proof coins and the bait and switch. That's a very serious problem. There's a lot of companies doing it. It's uh, it's terrible because it's you know these people are trusting and they're making that difficult step into buying precious metals and then they get scammed at the last minute. And it's you know frankly part of the reason we formed our company. We we were founded seven years ago specifically in, in opposition or in as a result of these people. Uh, that we're doing this, and we we uh, saw the op- business opportunity in, in doing it the right way, and and uh, you know there's much smaller margins in bullion, but you're actually giving people something of value and not not taking them for a ride. So, you know, the the other thing is, let's talk about ETFs. Um, yeah, that was definitely something I know, wanted to get into. Yeah, yeah. The, the, of course, you know, ultimately you want to own the metals directly mm. and either have it in your possession or in a storage account that you directly control and can access. And you don't want to introduce counterparty risk. So if you're buying gold and silver as insurance in part, why would you introduce risk into your insurance component? It's supposed to be insurance against the risk, not risk in itself. Mm. So one of the problems, and this is really where things could get kind of interesting in the gold and silver market, is that there are a tremendous amount of claims on physical gold and silver out there where people think they own gold and silver ounces. But in many cases, they may not. They may not have direct title to it. They may not even have an indirect title to it. It could be some notional type of thing, which isn't backed by the actual metal. And and so that's a real danger where there could be more claims on the gold and silver than exist. And, you know, I can get into a 
a longer discussion, I won't, but mm. about gold leasing and how that the swaps and all, how all those things happen in the financial system. But the bottom line is there's lots of gold out there to which there are multiple claims. And you do not want to be tied up in those kinds of, of arrangements. So avoid any kind of pooled account. Only purchase metals that you have either segregated or allocated ownership to. Uh, we prefer segregated. We don't do anything on an allocated basis. It's all segregated. So if you store gold and silver with us, with Money Metals and uh, Depository, you have a segregated account where your metal is exactly what you sent in or what you purchased. It's nothing else. It's not pooled with anybody else's metal. You're not going to get a different Silver Eagle back. You're not going to get a different Silver Bar back. You own the the exact thing that you buy is what you own, and that's kept in trust, in bailment, really. It's called bailment where we're just safeguarding your property. Mm. So you want to avoid any kind of pooled ownership. ETFs, now the problem with ETFs, now it's a, it's a, it's a positive thing for the market that these exist, and a lot of stock-type investors are going into physical gold and silver through these ETFs. But there still is counterparty risk there. And while it's a great way of you know, getting people introduced to gold and silver ownership, uh, it still has the risk of counterparties which include custodians and sub-custodians and sub-sub-sub-custodians. There's this whole chain chain of, of custody, which is a little murky, and something could happen. Now, I, I hope and don't think that there's huge problems there, but there's definitely some indication that not every ounce is accounted for in these vehicles. Uh, you know, there's been bar lists that have been published that have been wrong, and or that multiple people have you know, own, own the same bar supposedly, and you, you find these irregularities. So the bottom line is, you know, that might be an easy way to get into gold and silver, perhaps with your stock funds uh, and get out quickly if you want to buy and sell. But if you're owning precious metals for the longer term, I would suggest avoiding all the ETFs uh, and actually either rolling money into a self-directed IRA and owning it in a storage account or just owning it directly in your own possession. Okay. You know, and you brought up another interesting point there with the ETFs and this sort of segues into IRAs. My understanding is there is a way, some kind of way with IRAs where you can actually physically hold the gold yourself. How does, I could be totally getting this all wrong, but where, where do we go with that? Okay. Well, there's something called a self-directed IRA. Mm. So you can roll your IRA funds into a a separate IRA account called a self-directed IRA. Mm. And that is uh, an account that you are then able to buy non-typical assets. You can also buy um, stocks too, if you want, but you can buy real estate. You can buy shares of privately held companies. Uh, you can buy physical gold and silver or platinum or palladium and, and some other things. Um, so that's becoming pretty popular where people are rolling some of their IRA funds into self-directed IRAs, and then they're setting up a storage account with a place like Money Metals Depository or other places that we can refer you to, and then purchasing gold and silver and having it delivered into that account, which is owned and maintained by your IRA. So it's your IRA owns the metals. Now, there is a structure that have been has been promoted out there where you can be the custodian of your IRA metals uh, and, and actually hold them on behalf of an LLC, which is owned by your self-directed IRA. Mm. We don't recommend that. You know, it's not something we're comfortable actively promoting because I think there are some issues there. The idea when you when you have constructive control of your IRA funds, it's it can be considered a distribution by the IRS. So if they look at it closely and say, look, you know, this this is not really owned by the, your IRA, uh, or if it is, you you have access and use of it, and that that disqualifies it as an IRA asset. And here's your your bill, it's all taxable this year as regular income, and you owe us you know, 28% on the entire value of what's in there. That could happen. So we're not really recommending people use that structure, but uh, some people do, and, and that's really up to you. You know, Make sure you, you, know what, you, know, you have good advisors and helping you with that. But the bottom line is there's a lot of people that have money in IRAs. Self-directed IRAs is a great way to own physical gold directly you know, without counterparty risk. It's owned by your IRA. And, you know, a lot of people are doing that. Uh, so we, we work with a lot of folks that are setting up self-directed IRAs. 
Okay. So, and I know one of the other things is uh, like a vari- variable universal life insurance. We had discussed a little bit before the show, there's also ways to work with precious metals in that. Can you kind of walk us into yeah. that? Yeah, and that, this is not uh, – so I don't think you can do the self-directed part where you can buy the physical metal because a mm. lot of these are regu- not just regulated, but they have their in-house products. But a lot of these life insurance companies have um, what are called variable universal life policies where you can own mutual funds of any kind mm-hmm. and you know with your, with your uh, retirement accounts or really I'm sure I should say your life insurance accounts, which are sort of quasi-investments. So you can – set up one of those types of policies that has a, a whole range of mutual funds that you can invest in and get exposure to the gold market. More than likely, the gold ETF, the gold related or silver related investment option is going to be primarily uh, a stock based thing as opposed to a physical bullion based thing. Okay. But I could be wrong. There, there may be some out there that are, that are owning, uh, you know, like an ETF, uh, uh, shares of, of a trust that owns the physical metal. So there, there are a lot of ways to get exposure to gold. Again, you know, the closer that you have direct control of it, the better. Uh, so it depends on your priorities, but at the very least, you should have some gold and silver in your possession. And then if you want to go beyond that and, and own it in your IRA or own it in your life insurance policy, there, there are ways to do that. Okay. So, and I guess here's one of the other big questions, which is when it comes time to uh, divest ourselves of this investment. So what's the best way to actually sell silver or gold as an individual? Well, uh, it should be just as easy. And that's something you can ask whoever you're doing business with on the buy side, find out what the, the sell, you know, the sell back process is for us. It's just as easy as buying. You can either go onto our website. We publish the price that we will pay for any in individual item or quantities of that item and lock in a purchase order. Just like when you buy, you lock in a sales order, you lock in a, a purchase of the metals. You can also lock in a sale of those metals to us. And you know the, the process works really in reverse uh, of the purchase. On the purchase side, when you, when, when you buy from us, you lock prices, we guarantee a price. And this is typical, fairly typical for mm-hmm. most dealers. Um, we guarantee a price uh, that we're selling it to you. We lock that price. You make a commitment to pay for it rapidly. And then once we receive your cleared funds, we ship you the metal or we send it into your uh, depository account if that's where you've chosen to to hold it. On the other side of the transaction, when you're selling back, you get a commitment of what we'll pay and then you ship us the metal. And as soon as we receive it, we send you the funds either by, you know, wire or by direct deposit or write you a check, whatever your, your, your selection is. Hmm. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy to buy and sell, but it's not something most people have ever done before. So the first time is, you know, I, re- I remember many conversations I've had husbands and wives together on the phone, walking through the process. It's, you know, people are very comfortable now with buying and selling stocks. This isn't really a whole lot different, but it's new and yeah. people are, are understandably apprehensive. So we try to make it extremely easy, good communication. We know that, you know, people are already a little nervous, which is the reason they're buying gold and silver as they should be, you know, that there's a lot of risk, there's a lot of danger and people are, who are actually tuned into this or taking action and it's a new process for them. So we, we try to make it as, as seamless as possible and, and fast delivery, good communication. And it should be the same thing on the other side when you sell back. And another way is to go into a local coin dealer in your town mm. and ask what they'll pay. Now I would say that you know many of them are not able to pay as competitive a price because they may not have as much turnover. Mm. Uh, they may be flipping it to somebody like us after they purchase it. But some people don't want to send it through the mail uh, and and wait to get paid. They want to get paid right on the spot. Mm. And uh, particularly if they haven't dealt with somebody from a, a distance before, maybe that they, they're more comfortable just walking out of the store with the cash. But you might uh, get a little bit less for it. Maybe. Uh, not always, but uh, but it, it tends to be the case. Okay. Well, that's awesome information. And I think that was one of the big things I've always been wondering, which is, okay, I get all this stuff. And if you know the world doesn't blow up and I'm not having to buy and sell and do all, all my other transactions in gold or silver, how do I uh, sell this stuff? Should I ever need to uh, recoup the cash? Uh, so that's good to know. So let's get into y'all for a little bit. What 
you know, tell us, how did you get into this uh, as a business? Well, that's, uh, for me, it started, I was in public policy. I worked for a free market organization and, you know, fighting against forced unionism, which a group called National Right to Work. And so I've always been in the liberty movement. And I just, you know, for me, I actually was involved in real estate in the early part of the 2000s. And so I was really paying attention to interest rates and what, what drives interest rates. Why are they going up? Why are they going down? What's this Federal Reserve system? Why, how, how do they have so much control over this? And why are they inter- seemingly interfering with the market and what the market wants interest rates to be? And so that really started a process for me in you know, thinking about what is money and what is debt. And as part of that, I very quickly became interested in and started following closely precious metals and owning them. And uh, ultimately, I, I left my public policy job to uh, become a newsletter publisher. I'd already been working on this project for a number of years leading up to that, but I was president of a publishing company that was basically a, a prepper newsletter, subscription mm-hmm. publication, and you know, financial uh, advice, asset protection, privacy protection, practical self-reliance, uh, alternative health, you know, health freedom, and, and some of those things were all covered. And so a lot of our customers, or a lot of our subscribers, I should, I should say, were very interested in precious metals. And, you know, they would ask us, well, what, do you, what should we buy? Where should we buy it? And so we got a lot of questions from our readers about precious metals. And so clearly there was a lot of demand for precious metals. We were already, I was already personally invested to a great extent in precious metals. And, you know, I wanted to, to, to service these customers' needs and, and provide them with good, you know, opportunities to buy precious metals. But unfortunately, the people, the only people that seem to have any advertising dollars were the rare coin bait and switch operations. And mm. I already knew a little bit about them because I've been paying close attention to the market. And I knew that I wasn't buying rare coins. I certainly didn't want to buy, you know, artwork, which is basically how I view rare coins. I'm, I'm not interested in owning artwork. I'm interested in owning a tangible, transparent, liquid, you know, financial asset, which is what physical gold and silver is. So unfortunately, the, the, the only people that could seem to afford to advertise in our publication was the rare coin dealers. And of course, they were not doing a good job servicing our people or you know, if we gave them access to our people. So uh, we just decided, you know, I, I want to just form the company that sells the right stuff to our readers. And so I launched Money Metals Exchange as an in-house service to my newsletter subscribers. And it very quickly uh, took off, and we had the advantage of already have, having a built-in customer base, so we were able to manage the very small margins that come with selling the right kind of stuff, the small profit margins that we get. But when the volume gets really large, the small profit margin gives you a extremely viable and successful business, which mm-hmm. is what we are now. We, we now have uh, $120 million in annual sales. Uh, we have probably 80,000 customers, tens of thousands of which have purchased in the last year, and we're also a publisher at the same time. So I sold the I sold the newsletter company completely and uh, focused entirely on the precious metals company, which really overshadowed and outgrew the uh, the subscription publishing company. So that and that was my greatest passion anyway. So uh, I'm able to help people diversify out of paper money into the, into the precious metals, and also at the same time, educate them about the things driving precious metals and all the, the political aspects that play into it. So we're a publisher at the same time as a dealer. And in 2015, that combination, I think, gave us the, uh, ultimately allowed us to become precious metals dealer of the year in the United States, uh, as ranked by an international group that, that looks at dealers all across the world. Oh, cool. So Money Metals Exchange and MoneyMetals.com has uh, has really been a, a, a passion, and uh, and a, uh, it's really exciting to see as more and more people are waking up to what's happening. I think that we're going to be in a position to really help a lot of people as that 1% of people that own precious metals grows to 5 or 10% over the next few years. Mm-hmm. Well, very cool. Well, what is the best way for listeners today to connect with you? Please uh, get on our email list. Uh, just learn about the markets. Learn about what we're doing. Um, go to moneymetals.com, 
and uh, just uh, there'll be a pop up probably that will uh, hit you, which asks for your email address, or you can go down to the bottom of the page and subscribe to the free email newsletter. Um, and also for for your listeners specifically, I wanted to to give people uh, access to our silver starter kit, which is four ounce package of silver that is sold at our actual cost. Oh wow! It's a getting started package. We don't we we feel that you know over time you'll develop a, an appreciation for both us and for the metals and become customers that will buy repeatedly. So we're we have this getting started starter kit that you can buy. It's four ounces of silver at our cost right now. It's uh, somewhere in the $85 range, free shipping. So we actually lose money because of the shipping. But over time, we hope that we'll be able to to make that back and uh, and service you over, over the long haul. So the way that your listeners can access that special offer is at the very top of our website at moneymetals.com, there's a box that uh, says, please enter radio code. And if you just put in rabbit hole into that box, it will direct you to the special offer of the four ounces of silver. And I should mention what it is. It's it's the most common and popular forms of silver mm. that we sell. So you have one ounce silver eagle, you have a one ounce silver maple leaf, a one ounce silver round, walking liberty silver round, and then a half ounce silver round and five tenth ounce silver rounds. So you get a nice variety of different sizes and, and types of silver investments in that one little kit. Oh, very and cool. So just go to moneymetals.com and put rabbit hole into the box at the top of the page, and that will direct you to the offer. And is that top right, top left, top center? Top center. Okay. Literally right at the top. Super easy to find then. Awesome. Well, Stefan, again, thank you so much for being uh, our guest today and giving us some really great information about precious metals. Give us your website address one more time. Okay, great. It's moneymetals.com, as in these are the money metals. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is money, uh, gold and silver, platinum and palladium. We even sell copper, uh, believe it or not. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, most, most people buy gold and silver. That's what I would emphasize that you start with. So go to moneymetals.com. You can also call us at 1-800-800-1865. Awesome. Thank you again. My pleasure. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Become part of the Roving Horde Armada. Support the show and get great benefits. Go to iturh.net to help keep the show safe and sound, which keeps you safe and sound. Notes, links, and resources from today's episode and guest can be found by visiting in the rabbit hole.com slash E181. And with that, we wrap up episode 181 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. <laughs>